So for gender, the comparison is between level one and two. For genre, sorry, for genre, the comparison is between level one and two. Uh, so let me draw some lines here for you. Uh, so this is for genre, and this is where we are supposed to look at. So as you see, this there is a significant difference between level one, uh, which was um, conversation, and level two, which was academic. And then there is also a, a significant difference between the two levels of difficulty, and this is where we know where the comparison, what kind of comparison has been conducted. So we don't look at errors and errors in genre and difficulty interaction because they don't add much uh, to uh, to the the discussion here. Well, as you see, the uh, there is a significant difference between levels one and two as as indicated here by the p-value and the partial eta squared value is 0 0.055 which is uh, not that big really so the largest impact comes from genre and there is no combined impact of genre and difficulty together on our on our measurement because the p-value is greater than 0 0.05 as, as was mentioned uh, before so uh, I can now move down to uh, further analysis to see what's going on. Uh, actually, I can get, get a feel for, for the mean. Uh, for genre 1 and 2, as you remember, the, uh, the, there was a significant difference, as you can see here, in the pairwise comparisons right here. Uh, and the significance difference is in favor of genre 1. That's, uh, that's uh, the genre of academic conversation and that's that's very interesting because conversations seem to be more more difficult than uh, sorry conversations not acad not academic many talks so conversations seem to be more difficult uh, sorry less difficult uh, oops because the mean is higher uh, so when the mean is higher that's less difficult because people scored highly on it so um, yeah, I was surprised because I was misinterpreting the results. But for se for the second uh, type of genre, which is academic, we have a lower mean, which means it's easier. Uh, it's it's more difficult, uh, and as a result, the significance he, uh, the significance value is below 0 0.05. And actually, there is a large difference between the two mean scores, as you can see, uh, with the highest uh, score on this test being 10. This is really a large, large difference between the two means. So yes, there is a difference, and the difference is in favor of uh, the academic genre, meaning that the academic genre is significantly more difficult than the conversation genre, and I'm not surprised to, to see that. Okay, so then we have we have multivariate test. It's really a repetition. I have I have discussed this before in another video. Uh, I have. Uh, demonstrated that SPSS actually outputs quite a lot of similar tables so you don't have to uh, you know look into every table that's generated because it's exactly the same thing that we looked at previously now for difficulty um, uh, I had assumed that sections 1 and 2 are easy and sections 3 and 4 are more difficult and there is some some um, actually truth to that because the mean score of the first and uh, this first and second section together uh, is about 4.7 uh, and and is uh, slightly above the uh, mean score of sections four three and four and that's three points uh, four point three approximately four four point three. Um, well, the difference is not that big, but it's still significant statistically, but the partial eta squared value is not that high, which means that although there is a significant difference between those four sections, uh, or I should say those two groups of difficulty, uh, the impact is not that, that significant, is not, is not that resounding. And then we also looked at the interaction effect of, of gender and genre and difficulty, but there was no significant difference. At this point, if there is any significant differences, SPSS, as I have mentioned this in at least two previous two of the previous videos I have created, if there is any significant difference, unfortunately, SPSS does not generate that. So you have to write uh, uh, some notations in the 
uh, syntax if you're interested please look at the previous video so for this video I'm not going to do that because it doesn't make much sense since there is no significant differences uh, caused by uh, the combined impact of genre and difficulty and another indication why there is no no um, interaction effect uh, that this is interaction effect, right? The, why there is no interaction effect is is the fact that these these lines are not extremely are not significantly converging or di converging or are not diverging from each other or that the, there is no intersection between these two lines in the graph. Actually, there's another way of representing the same thing. He, genre here is uh, presented horizontally. Um, but what is on the horizontal axis is the difficulty here. But in, both of these graphs show that there is no intersection, and in, an intersection would look like uh, would look like this. For example, this one line, and this represents another line. So th this section indicates that there is an interaction. But if this this is not the only way that we could conclude that there was and there would be an interaction if one of the lines moves, for example, to, towards downwards to this direction, and another one uh, in a very different direction like that is still downward, but they are diverging from each other. This could also indicate that there might be an interaction. Of course, we we also we always need to look at the statistics to make sure that there is there is or there is not any interactions. And that's where we uh, actually have to look at um, the uh, the multivariate tests and this uh, genre uh, difficult to interaction and the p-value for that. So I, I think this is all about this um, um, kind of uh, repeated measures ANOVA. Um, I have demonstrated how to run how to run a two by two repeated measures ANOVA across genre and difficulty. If you have more uh, levels, actually you can add more levels to it. You just need to reset and, and continue uh, doing everything that uh, I have um, explained in, in this and the previous video. Um, that brings me to the end of this video, but oh gosh, I just rem remember that I have always wanted to look into the normality of residuals and luckily this time around I, I remembered. So I'm going to look into the normality of the residuals. SPSS generates three residual value, residual uh, um, variables automatically and if if you remember I got them uh, from, let me just go back to the save menu, uh, I got it from save, uh, standardized and then click to continue. There is one one variable generated per each of our variables. So this this is the residual for uh, conversation easy and the second one is the residual for academic easy, the third one for conversation difficult and the third the last one uh, is the standardized residual for academic difficulty. And we want to figure out whether they are normally distributed which uh, may or may not be. So I, I like to go to uh, explore. This is one way of looking at it um, I'm going to reset everything and only move standardized residuals to uh, our dependent variables. We don't have an independent variable, so we leave it as is. For statistics, I would like to look at the outliers and just to make sure that there are no outliers. For this one, I'm uh, my preference is looking at histograms because they they actually give a more uh, uh, relatable kind of distribution and shape and then I will check normality plots with tests. That's where the tests are of Shapiro-Wilk and uh, Kolmogorov-Smirnov are, are generated and then uh, of course options just leave it as is and we don't want to do a bootstrap and just click OK. And we just wait for a while. Um, yes, and we got the statistics. So these are descriptive statistics and again, descriptive statistics, you can look at the skewness and kurtosis values. Uh, let me again draw some boxes in some lines here to make sure that you see what I mean. Uh, so skewness, the skewness and kurtosis values are, 
uh, are located in this line. So the skewness is pretty low, and kurtosis is also low. Uh, a lot of textbook po textbooks would uh, would would tell you that well, since these two statistics fall between minus two and plus two, so your data is normal distributed, and you don't have any you shouldn't have any concerns about it. But then and there are other schools of thoughts which I have um, actually talked in another video uh, okay here for the, for the second skewness uh, and kurtosis value was it this the first one the second one is here for the second standardized residual we can uh, let me activate this uh, table so um, I can highlight it here actually these two skewness and kurtosis values are also fine uh, if you are interested to uh, compute the z value of standardized residuals you can you can divide each value by its uh, error standard error and you'll get a z value for it which if it's uh, larger than uh, the absolute value of 1.96 then it's deviating from residuals uh, from from normality uh, but again I have explained how to use that Z standardized that the the Z value for skewness and kurtosis in other videos please for more information please watch those videos if you're interested and here as you see skewness is slightly higher than the previous skewness values and and kurtosis is also higher but uh, the stand, standard errors are smaller so chances are that we have a little bit of deviation from uh, normality and finally uh, we have skewness and kurtosis uh, of 0 0.7 and uh, minus 0 0.484 with small standard errors when uh, so well well you can also do some estimation because um, you might be interested to estimate the z values here as well what I'm, I'm more interested in is actually not z values to be honest with you I'm, I'm more interested in looking at the uh, here uh, Kolmogorov Smirnov test of normality and Shapiro Wilk because our sample size, like I said, falls b between 50 and 300. Um, so I see s that there is some deviation, actually, significant deviation from normality. So we might say that one of the assumptions of repeated measures ANOVA uh, does not hold. But again, you might argue that since uh, skewness and kurtosis values are within the range that I mentioned before then it holds it really depends on which uh, textbook you you prefer but again there are some uh, uh, perhaps more precise and more reliable ways of explaining it which I as I mentioned I have discussed in another video so uh, here are the shapes of our distribution obviously this is a lot more like a normal distribution this is the first the, the z standardized residuals for uh, the first variable and this uh, qq plus is also telling us more or less the same story because this line represents a normal distribution and these dots here represent our data and they're not falling far away from the normal distribution so we have some evidence there and I'm gonna move down to I'm not gonna um, explain those plots and this obviously shows this box uh, plot this shows that there is there's no uh, outlier which is good news for us uh, it, this is slightly uh, skewed negatively um, and if you look at the QQ plus you see the, that the the dots are not falling far away from the normal distribution line so it's probably fine and there are no outliers but here we see an obvious skewness it's a positive skewness and uh, there is some deviation from the normality line uh, I wouldn't say that the deviation is huge but still it's nice to consider that and finally um, in standardized residuals for um, academic difficult um, uh, variable is actually is actually slightly deviating from or somewhat deviating from the normal distribution line as you, as you see they are still along the line but they 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 have some some deviations from it so this positive skewness might be an indication that we have some degrees of violation of normal normality 
of the residuals. Therefore, if you ask me whether or not this 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 is a good uh, data, uh, this is the suitable data, or this is the right kind of analysis for this data set. I I have two answers to that. By one school of thought, yes, it would be because uh, uh, you look at the skewness and kurtosis values, and that's just good enough. In addition, a lot of people argue that um, uh, ANOVA, the family of ANOVA tests are quite robust against uh, the uh, uh, violation of normality. But that's one school of thought. But another school of thought, which I have I've alluded to at the start of this, the first section of this video, is that uh, those assumptions that I have just shown you, for example, like the uh, normality of residuals, have to be met so your ANOVA will return no, uh, reliable results. If they do not met, then if they're uh, they're not met, then you have to do uh, non-parametric tests. Uh, in other videos, I'll try to show you how non-parametric tests can be run uh, for different purposes. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'm glad that I finally covered the idea of residuals in this video. Uh, if you liked the video, give it a like, and please subscribe to the channel. Uh, have a good day.